Hey, deserving listeners, I thought I would answer your emails today. A lot of you have been emailing me about Kanye West because he has been having some internet media as of late. I think he has a new album coming out, which is usually the case. And I've made a full episode about Kanye West called The Psychology of Kanye. And you can listen to that. I did it with Umberto. I think it came out a couple years ago. And we did a full deep dive into his uh, personality and what we can see from the internet. The first thing I'll say is that I cannot diagnose from afar. No, cl- no ethical clinician can because it's impossible to really know what's really going on. When you are looking at someone through the pinhole of the internet, you don't really know who they are. When, when I assess people, particularly when it comes to something like a personality disorder, I have to work with people for weeks before I can confidently even begin to hypothesize about a personality disorder for that person. Just reading the criteria in the DSM is not a effective way of diagnosing people. You know, it's like, well, you know, they seem grandiose, they seem this and that. And so it, it's very important. And, and people go to school for years and years learning how to diagnose. And the internet just thinks they can read the DSM and diagnose. Now, there are some things that you could probably get away with as a layperson diagnosing from uh, without being a clinician. Certain anxiety disorders, maybe depression is pretty easy. Major depressive disorder is pretty easy to diagnose. But beyond that, it's really hard. So so there's that. I'm not going to diagnose from afar. I never have and I never will. Um, but uh, people are asking, does it look like bipolar? Does it look like borderline? Does it look like narcissistic personality? And some people are emailing saying like, well, bipolar and borderline look similar. And I've heard this before, and I've actually seen this from clinicians. So if you're not really familiar, bipolar is essentially just two poles to a mood disorder in which you cycle at some uh, pace, at some uh, cycle between depression which I think most of us understand, and mania. Mania is where you have a ton of energy, you have a ton of self-confidence, and at higher levels of mania, you can even become delusional, where you think you're a golden god and that everyone is your minion. Uh, That's it in brief. I've treated people with psychotic bipolar before. It's not really a specialty of mine, but um, I have seen it. I've definitely treated a lot of people with depression. The uh, borderline personality disorder is really very different from bipolar, and I really don't understand why it gets mixed up, even in clinicians' minds. Borderline personality disorder is, it doesn't have cycles to it. Now, you could have spikes in distress related to borderline, but when you have borderline personality disorder, you don't, you, you don't cycle between different mood uh, states you have a extreme sensitivity to abandonment because of the traumas that you've been through. And when you are distressed, then you're gonna have a reaction. But the abandonment sensitivity is always there. If you're bipolar, you have two different, or maybe even three different states, maybe four, where you have depression, you have where you're neither depressed nor manic, you have hypomania, which means uh, low mania, and then you have full-on mania. So. Uh, and some people can cycle quite quick. They can cycle in the span of a day they can, or they can sp- uh, cycle in the span of a year. And, and it's really particular to the individual. And we have different designations for these things. Some people become psychotic and delusional. Some, uh, some don't. Some respond to medication pretty well. Some don't. With borderline, there's no medication for that. With bipolar, there is. Uh, medication doesn't always work for bipolar, but, um, but that should tell you something about the genesis of these disorders that bipolar is often considered more of an organic brain problem and borderline is uh, considered conceptualized more as a personality problem, a perceptual problem. And, and so they're really very different. And I, I've had borderline clients of mine go to the emergency room and get diagnosed with bipolar upon a five minute interview, which I just find to be absurd because the borderline individual is having a extreme reaction and they go to the ER for whatever reason and they just get labeled bipolar and they are given a medication. Now, my speculation about that is that there is no medication for borderline and borderline is often misunderstood. 
But there are medications for bipolar. And so if you're a medical professional, I, I have a suspicion, of course, I have no data on this, that uh, it's tempting to see it as a bipolar problem because you have a medication for that and you have, a, you have presum presumably a treatment. Whereas borderline, a psychiatrist isn't going to do anything to help you uh, in an emergency room uh, because that's you know just the nature of, of the um, disorder. But anyway, so getting back to uh, Kanye, the, the different diagnoses that have been thrown out there that I, I talked about in my deep dive, I talked about bipolar, I talked about narcissistic personality disorder, I talked about just general trauma reactivity, I talked about opioid addiction, and I talked about head injury. Um, he had a car accident in 2002. So it's possible that his, his – so all of this depends on the – uh, observation and the conclusion that he has odd behavior. So that, because that's what everyone is basing this on. Ba basically, everyone looks at his tweets or his interviews or his ranting and raving or the things he says, and they say, oh, he's, he's acting strange. Kanye is acting, or his, his long speeches at, at uh, concerts or his jumping up on stage during award shows. They all look at the the you know the gestalt or the entirety of all these behaviors, and they they think, well, he must be mentally ill. There must be something wrong with him. Well, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of mental illness. You can act strangely and not ha and not qualify for a DSM label. You can act in a weird, quirky, unconventional manner and still not qualify for a mental illness. There's this uh, mistake that people make. It, you, you, I'll hear it when there's a serial killer or a, or a mass murderer. People often say, oh, he must be crazy. There must be something wrong with him. You know, what, I wonder what mental illness is driving that behavior. Now, so there, there's two misunderstandings there. One is, is that a mass murderer or someone who does something strange um, is automatically suffering from a mental illness, which is definitely not true. Uh, many mass murderers have been found to not qualify for a DSM diagnosis, or at least one that really would compel one to be a mass murderer. I mean, you know, if you suffered from depression, it's not like that causes you to be a mass murderer, the vast, vast, vast majority of... So that brings me to the other misunderstanding is a lot of people say, well, if you have a mental disorder, that's why you did those weird things, whether it was mass murder or doing a Twitter storm or something. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding of mental illness as well. Just because you, uh, you know, qualify for a DSM di diagnosis, DSM label, that doesn't mean that you automatically will do all these really strange things. In fact, the vast majority of people who uh, qualify for a DSM label don't do anything strange at all. And I think half of people will eventually qualify for a DSM label and thus half of everyone is quote unquote mentally ill. So we, it's just this fundamental misunderstanding. And so when we look at Kanye's behavior, what is going on? Well, I as a clinician have to conclude that I just don't know. Now, there are some public figures that are easier for me to hypothesize around. Um, I won't go into it now, but there's enough data for me to grab in order to develop some sense of hypotheses that would be worth pursuing if I were to treat them or were to assess them. With Kanye, it's hard because there's a lot of bravado in hip hop and there's a lot of, uh, shall we say, um, uh, acceptable narcissism. I'm the best rapper in the world, that kind of thing. And so it's hard to know. And he has a lot of things to say and people love him. People, people want him to say things or, and or people more recently kind of provoke him to say things. So my sense of him, regardless of any DSM label that he would qualify for, is that he's just kind of nerdy. And when I hear him talk, he just sort of misses social cues. And I'm not saying that he's autistic or anything. I'm just saying that uh, I suspect that as he was growing up, he just didn't really acquire the same social skills that maybe other public figures gain. And he just seems to be kind of unaware or sort of oblivious in some ways, in, in some, I think, charming ways, really, because he'll say things and you're just like, wow, you know, that's pretty honest right there. And a lot of people would avoid saying something like that. So I think that that's, and that's not a diagnosis. That's just a, that's just a personality aspect, if you will. 
Now, he has said that he suffers from bipolar and that he takes medication. So on one level, we would want to regard his opinion since he knows himself better than any of us would. So maybe he does have bipolar. Was he assessed for that? It sounds like he was, at least according to him, and he was given medication. Bipolar is a good candidate as a hypothesis. Um, and to be clear, there have probably been other clinicians who have assessed him fully. Um, so it's not like it hasn't been done, but I'm not a privy to that to those assessments. But anyway, so the behavior that we see in Kanye that could be related to bipolar is that he seems to disappear from the public eye for a period of time, which is a very, very, uh, you know, uh, faded red flag for depression, you know, just because someone disappears from the internet for a while doesn't mean they're depressed. But, you know, if one had bipolar, it would, it would stand a reason that they, it would follow that, that pattern. And then he has these moments where all of a sudden, boom, he is in the media spotlight and he's, you know, doing all these interviews and he's saying all these media worthy things. Now, is he intelligent enough to say, well, I got to do something wacky in order to get on the headlines to be relevant or, you know, or is it something that's out of his control or is he just a weird dude who likes to talk about weird things? I mean, a lot of the weird, th I'll tell you, a lot of the weird things, quote unquote weird things that I see people saying about Kanye is when he's being extremely self-disclosing, is when he's being extremely honest about how he feels. And this is, uh, I just want to say labeled as, well, he must be mentally ill, as if a black man can't talk about his sensitive side, as if a me public media figure can't cry in front of cameras about things that are really distressing to them. He has a recent video of him crying about his own daughter and how, well, first he's crying about his father and he's crying about, I mean, from what I can tell, there's a whole bunch of people filming him and he he's crying about how his dad abandoned him and about how his how his own daughter uh, he just he feels connected to his daughter and and he but this clip gets um, excerpted P people will pull it out and Kanye is crying and everyone's pointing their cameras at him his, their phone cameras at him and he's saying I almost killed my daughter so if you just take that out of context and you just see like Kanye ranting and raving saying, I almost killed my daughter and he's crying, that sounds weird, right? It sounds, oh, you must be crazy. You must have a mental illness. Well, if you watch the whole thing, he starts off by talking about how he, I think he's saying that his dad wanted to abort him when he was, uh, un, when he was an unborn person. And then he naturally goes to his own daughter and how the thought of abortion might have crossed his mind, but he decided not to do it. And how uh, this is a con this is a connected issue for him of his his dad didn't really want him, but he really he himself really loves and wants his own daughter, that kind of thing. Now, could this be in line with uh, bipolar? Sure. One could be manic and uh, off their medication and not really fully their normal self. Uh, when one is manic, you tend to talk a lot. You tend to think all your thoughts are worthy of being told to everyone. You tend to have a lot of ideas. You tend to, sometimes people don't even sleep for several days, and so there's more time to tweet and this kind of thing. Now, some people say, well, He's releasing an album, and so that's why he's doing this. And that's certainly a possibility, absolutely. However, it's also possible that as his album is about to be released, it might actually trigger a manic episode in him. Uh, you, m the mania and the cycle of bipolar can be triggered by events. So those things both can be true, um, and both might not be true. Now, in terms of borderline personality disorder, that would be really hard to diagnose in him, given what we have seen. Uh, I certainly haven't seen much indication of that. Um, the, the thing I'll say, though, is uh, that there's just general trauma reactivity. He, he's, he's had some difficulty early in life, as a lot of us have. And when we, and we're going to have emotional reactions as those traumas are triggered. Now, 
one can have full-blown PTSD or complex PTSD or any number of personality disorders. Or one could just have traumas that are just really tough for us, bad moments in our past, particularly our childhood, that get touched upon and we become unhinged or very emotional or, you know, or say things that we wouldn't say normally or rant and rave about things that we wouldn't do normally. The difference is, is that Kanye just happens to be in front of a billion cameras and whenever he's in public, everyone points their camera at him waiting for him to say the next weird thing because they want to sell their video to TMZ. I mean, you know, I don't know that for sure, but that's my impression. Now, let's also talk about narcissistic personality disorder because a lot of people think he might suffer from that. Again, there's no way to know. I would have to assess someone for five to ten, to ten sessions, a willing client to build on that hypothesis. But we do see some behaviors that would build a hypothesis for narcissism, which is that he, particularly his award behavior and the way he talks about himself and the, the kinds of business ventures he goes into and the way he talks about his business ventures. So now, could that be narcissistic personality? Could it be bipolar? I don't, I don't know. Could, it be, could he also be affected by opioid addiction? Um, I don't remember the, the whole details on, oh, he said he was addicted to, to opioids. And, you know, could that, could that affect things? Sure. But typically when you are using opioids habitually, it doesn't cause you to do a bunch of strange behavior. Uh, a bunch of strange behavior caused by substances is usually associated with things like alcohol or stimulants like meth, that kind of thing. Taking opioids, you tend to just relax and you tend to just feel good and you, you fall asleep and you're just kind of, you just, you just feel numb. And so opioid addiction isn't a good candidate for explaining what, if people are accusing him of strange behavior, opioid addiction isn't a good candidate for a conceptualization as to why he would do that sort of thing. And like I said, head, 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 head injury could absolutely be another part of it. So that's my very, very brief. You want to hear the whole episode, go, go you know, Google uh, Psychology in Seattle, the psychology of Kanye West episode and listen to that episode for more. All right, let's go into another email. Okay, my goal is, is to get through as many emails as possible. And whenever I do these email episodes, I think, yeah, I, I could probably get to like 10 or 15 emails in this hour. And sometimes I only get to one or two. <laughs> so I want to do a speed round. So Sam from Seattle, she asks, I personally love the show Gilmore Girls. You've shared your admiration of the show on the podcast as well. And I'm curious what you think about the enmeshed family dynamic between the mother and the daughter. The mother often says she loves the sh My mother often says she loves the show because it reminds her of our relationship. Just wanted to hear your thoughts on the psychology of these mother-daughter relationship styles. End of email. Yeah, I love the Gilmore Girls. I think I've watched it all the way through two and a half times. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I watched it when it was coming out. Then I got the DVDs. And then I maybe I watched it three times through. Anyway, I just love the show. And uh, yeah, the way I would characterize the relationship between the mother-daughter relationship in, on Gilmore Girls is enmeshed, but also healthy. So it, it, it's tempting to label them as enmeshed, which I'll grant on a certain level. But enmeshment requires inflexibility and a lack of closeness. People often will look at, you know, people are, are wanting me to talk about the reality TV show Smothered, and I haven't seen the show, but from the previews, it looks like, at least with some of the relationships, the mother and the daughter are just very close. And that might look weird to you, and we will, as a society, just automatically pathologize that. But there's a lot of different styles of relationship. Let's say that uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you rarely ever opened up to your mother as a daughter. Do we pathologize that? No, we'd be like, well, that's just normal. Well, in Western society, it certainly is. And there are big problems with having you know, those very rigid boundaries with one parent. So it can be a problem. But anyway, so the, uh, let's not confuse being close and very involved in each other's lives as enmeshment. Enmeshment is a description for dysfunction. Uh, there is pressure to conform. There is sometimes subtle abuse. 
and major guilt and shame trips that will happen. And so while in an enmeshed relationship from the outside, they might look close, but if you actually ask the individuals, particularly, uh, you know, one person in the relationship, they'll often report that they don't really feel unconditional love, if you will. You know, they, they feel like their the love that they get in their family, in an enmeshed family, is very conditional, very conditional on conformity and doing what the other people say. I didn't get that impression from the Gilmore Girl relationship. Uh, but there is a, there is enmeshed tendencies, which I'll get into in a second. So, um, so there's so I'm going to frame it as like enmeshed ten. It's a healthy relationship with enmeshed tendencies. And now, why is it primarily a healthy relationship? Well, if you never heard the show, I'm not going to talk about this very long. So, because <laughs> I'm trying to do a speed round, if you remember. But uh, there's a lot of flexibility, and the relationships are between the mother and the daughter. They're allowed to speak their mind. And they have a level of independence when they want it, that kind of thing. But there is a bit of enmeshment. The pros and cons of having a bit of enmeshment and having this style of relationship where there's a lot of involvement is that you get a lot of closeness. Uh, you get, you got to be best friends. The, you know, the, this mother and daughter are best friends. There's a lot of honesty between them. They get a lot of their attachment needs met between each other. They get a lot of their dependency needs met, um, you know, uh, there's just a good feeling between the two of them. The cons with the little bit of enmeshment in there is that they can be very hurt by disapproval between the two of them. If, if either one of them disapproves of the other person, it can be very, very difficult for that person to cope with that. And they have big fights. So if, if they were to, ha so that if they were to shift to a less enmeshed style of healthy relationship, they would gain independence and probably reduce their conflict, but they would probably also lose out on a little bit of the closeness. There's also a lack of independence sometimes in the relationship where each person couldn't really do things without the other person approving of it. But in some respect, one would say, well, th this mother-daughter duo has been a duo for a long time. They've survived a lot. Uh, Lorelai uh, had her, uh, had her daughter uh, early in life, and you know, as a teenager, and so they had to uh, survive on the two of them. And so, uh, yeah, that's a speed round. So that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> all right, speed round, speed round. This next email is from patron Georgia from Scotland. She writes. I'm looking to pursue a counseling or psychotherapy career in the future. I am curious to know what your opinion is on code switching or changing your register of speech as a therapist. Here in Scotland, there is a distinctive association with the strength of your accent to certain social class or background. When I was growing up, I developed code switching to fit in with peers as a defense against bullying. However, it is something I continue to use as an adult most often unintentionally, to make others feel at ease and to build rapport. In my current work, I frequently find myself adjusting my accent and vocabulary depending on who I am speaking with as I work with a diverse range of people. For example, I may speak with a broader accent and use more Scots dialect and slang with someone who does the same, even though I don't speak that way with my closest friends and family. Would this be an asset or a hindrance in the context of providing therapy? I wonder if this is something you discuss with your students and supervisees. Perhaps you specifically advise not to adjust register at all. Is there any code of practice around this? End of email. This is a great question. There's a lot to unpack, but because I'm in the speed round, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. So from the sound of it, patron Georgia from Scotland, it sounds like you don't usually use Scots dialect if I'm understanding right. And when you are talking to someone that does use Scots dialect, you certain a certain uh, slang, you will adopt that slang or that more broader accent to talk to them, even though with the people that you are with normally, you don't have that aspect. And when you were young in life, younger in life, you learned how to speak with that accent and dialect because it got you out of bullying and you now use it as an adult as a way of as 
I think reading between the lines, what you're saying is you feel like you're tricking people into liking you because you're tricking them into making them think you're one of them when really you're not one of them, quote unquote. I don't know if that's what you're saying. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. And as a therapist, it's something that we all have to think about. In Seattle, it's less of an issue, uh, but it is a thing. You know, code switching, there, you, you had a longer email and you were wondering if this happened or you were suspecting this happens all over the world. And it does, absolutely. There are so many types of code switching. For example, I code switch all the time as a therapist and a professor and, and just as you know, someone who socializes with people. So I have my, shall I say, my, my general code that I operate from, which I would characterize as like mainstream Seattle, um, I don't know, middle class, just kind of vanilla uh, Seattle culture. <laughs> but I also have a Asian American uh, code that I will go into with other Asian Americans. There, there's a there's a slight accent change actually. Uh, there's a lot of O's <laughs> that I, I actually first saw my dad do this when I was growing up. My dad's Japanese American. Um, you know, he was born and raised in the States, but when he would talk with Asian, other Asian American people, or just people from Asia, he would do a lot of, he would say a lot of, oh, 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 you know, when, like when we'd go to a Japanese restaurant, he'd be ordering and the Japanese waiter would be like saying something. My dad would do a lot of the Japanese American uh, vocalizations to encourage people to continue talking. I saw, oh, oh, I see, oh, oh. <laughs> and my dad doesn't do that with middle class white people. So there is an Asian American code that I would go into. Um, you know, taking more pictures of your food, for example, <laughs> uh, making sure you talk a lot about kimchi and noodles. I mean, literally. Um, so there's an Asian American code that I go into that isn't my normal code because most people I hang out with aren't Asian American, honestly. There's a man code that I will go into when I talk to men that I don't know that well, clients included, um, not all clients, but it's particular. So if, if I'm with a, what I believe to be a masculine person who, 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 who seems to identify as a very masculine individual, then I have a masculine code. And that's a pretty comfortable code to me because I, throughout my life, have a part of me that is quite masculine, um, who doesn't want to shy away from getting in a fist fight or doesn't want to back down from other people's BS. You know, the, there's a certain kind of um, man, masculine code that I'll go into. And sometimes I'll use it strategically. So, patron Georgia, I guess the question for you is, is this code of yours genuine or is it fake? If, if it's genuine, then you can use it strategically to, to build rapport with clients that might appreciate someone using that slang and dialect. If you have the belief that this code of yours is very fake and it's really, really just something you do to trick people, then we might want to look at that, right? Um, having different codes is a normal part of anyone who doesn't come from mainstream culture. And really, most people have various codes. Like I said, you know, men are certainly mainstream, but yet I have a masculine code. I also have a code that I used to go into with teenagers. I don't treat teenagers anymore, but I did for the first 15 years of my career. And when I talked to teenagers, I would enter a teen mode where I might even dress differently to to, you know, I wouldn't wear a suit, for example, to meet with a teenager. I might um, dress more like a younger person, try to talk like a younger person, not in a fake way, but in a way that is genuinely me, but also not trying to come across like I'm some stuffy adult person. So to answer your question, patron Georgia, it is something to think about. It's often not talked about explicitly. And it's a wonderful thing. You already have this awareness about yourself and you have some contemplating to do. Once you become a therapist, you want to contemplate it. You know, what, what are these two different modes of mind? What other modes do I have? Uh, and you want to talk with your supervisor about it. And you, you want to think about whether or not this code of yours is genuine to you, because it could be. Even though you developed it as a child in response to being bullied, it might be 
a, a legitimate part of you, even though you you think, well, I don't really come from those that part of the community or something. Um, so it's possible that it is a genuine part of you. It's also possible that you consider it a not genuine part of you. And, you know, just give that some thought. All right, speed round. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. She writes, I was wondering if you could talk about sexual fluidity. I think about sexual fl- fluidity in three ways. Number one, people who experience attractions suddenly that are outside of their realm of usual attractions. For example, a lesbian falling in love with a man, but he is the only exception. Is this societal? Is it biological? I don't really know, but I find it very interesting. Okay, before going on with the rest of her email, just chiming in here. Yeah, uh, this happens all the time. And how do we frame it? Is it societal? Is it biological? For example, a there it's really case-by-case case basis, um, and it depends on the individual and how they want to conceptualize it. There are certainly people who will 100% identify as lesbian and then find themselves falling in love with a man and wonder, this has never happened before. I thought I had gone through my sexual orientation journey, and now I'm 35, and I feel like very romantically and sexually attracted to this man. What is happening? Am I am I bisexual? Uh, what's going on here? And then later on, they're just they never fall in love with another man. They're just like, well, there's something about just that man. That, that. so, what is that? Well, we could call that uh, uh, by their they were just slightly bisexual. We could call that that it was just something about that dude that just, you know, really got to that lesbian person. Um, so in that case, the way I described it, we wouldn't call it societal because the person had already um, really f- fully come out and felt very comfortable being lesbian. Uh, I, you know, it's hard to know exactly because I just hypothetical, but you could have another situation where you have a 22 year old lesbian woman who is not out of the closet with everyone and has a tremendous amount of pressure and feels a lot of shame about being a lesbian and doesn't want to live the life of a lesbian in her community and finds a man and and you know convinces herself that she's attracted to him and maybe there is some level of attraction there you know if you really kind of force it you find the right person you fall in love with that person and then 20 years later, after you know that relationship ends and she comes out of the closet and lives the life that she wants to, she looks back and she's like, well, you know, I was in love with that man and I was sexually attracted to him, but I was never sexually attracted or in love with any other man. Well, in that instance, it, we might, the individual person might conceptualize their um, you know, sexual fluidity as societal. They might say like, well, the only reason why I was ever even open to falling in love with that guy was because I was under pressure from my society to do so. And if I was left to my own devices, I never would have given him a second thought. And so a big part of the reason why I was with him was just because I was, I was trying to force heterosexuality into a lesbian's body sort of thing. So there's a lot of different ways to look at it, and there's no way to know whether something is societal or biological. It just depends on the individual, because we don't have a, a blood test f- for this. We can't look for a numerical marker and say, oh, that was mostly sci- society that caused that behavior, uh, as opposed, opposed to biological, plus you know, intelligent philosophers of contemporary people will uh, say that society and biology are intertwined um, and are in some ways the same thing if you really look into the entire topic. But anyway, so that's that. Let's go on to number two here. Number two, you write, fluctuations within bisexuality. I am bisexual, but generally prefer men. Bisexual people will often report their sexuality as fluctuating randomly. Some days they are leaning towards men more, other days leaning towards women. Sometimes it follows a hormonal cycle. Sometimes it depends on the relationship they are in. It is sometimes colloquially referred to as the bi-cycle. I've noticed this happening to me too. Do bisexual people report changes more often than monosexualities? What causes these changes? 
just chiming in here. Yeah, this is something that a lot of bisexual people will talk about. The the issue, uh, the, there are two things, that, there's a lot that one could say, uh, but there are two things that I'll say. One is, is that when you are monosexual, meaning you are heterosexual or gay, lesbian, there are, say, you know, you might have fluctuations within the, so if you're a heterosexual man, you might have fluctuations in the type of woman you are attracted to, but you're never, you might not ever be attracted to a man. So you might one day want tall women and the next day you're attracted to short women or the next day you're attracted to, you know, curvy women and the next day you're attracted to, you know, there or bossy women and, you know, there, there's all f- sorts of things, women in control, women who are subservient, these kinds of things. So these fluctuations happen in monosexual people, but they don't take a lot of note of it necessarily because it's not as noticeable. Whereas when you're bisexual, it, it's so much more noticeable because we frame so many things around gender. We frame all of our lives, like one of the things that I just find to be bizarre when I zoom out on our society is that nearly every single psychological study breaks out by men and women. Why is that? I mean, it's an important thing to break out, but why not other markers? Why don't we break out by um, how tall you are <laughs> or other kinds of, there's just, we just have this obsession with, uh, with gender. And if you're bisexual or you're queer, gender queer, you might uh, relate to this. It's just like, can we just get away a little bit from the dichotomy between men and women? <laughs> can, can we talk about other ways of describing human beings than look at that man, look at that woman? Anyway, so to the bisexual person, it, you might find that you know during a particular time of the month, you're like attracted to uh, another gender that you aren't always as attracted to in the other part of the month because of hormones. Or you might find that you go through three years of being attracted to a particular gender and another three years of a different kind of a gender. Um, so uh, so there's that. Now, of course, we could go case by case basis. And, and I have with people, there are so many different things that play into it. Like you might have a really bad relationship with a woman and just be like, you know what? I'm off women. I'm, I'm going back to men. I, I want to have a relationship with men because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so there's a lot of different individual reasons why people will, um, you know, switch back and forth or have different bi cycles, if you will. The second big thing that I have heard from bisexual people as to what's going on there is that they will perceive that the, at least the men and women that they will date will have very different energies, generally speaking. They'll say like, well, there's a different energy to and a different vibe to a relationship with a woman as to a relationship with a man. And generally speaking, when I'm in a relationship with a man, it has this kind of vibe. And when, you know, generally speaking, when I'm in a relationship with a woman, it has this kind of vibe. And so, so that's another reason why it might fluctuate because you might have different attachment needs given your situation, if you will. And the associations you have with that vibe could play a pretty big role in your um, efforts to romantically join with other people. For example, um, I know some a bisexual woman who doesn't who, who is she identifies as bisexual and she she likes having sex with men, but when it comes to relationships, she wants to have a long term relationships with women, and so for her anyway, when she just wants to have a good time and she, and she wants to be single and she wants to be free, then she's going to have a lot more sex with men. And she might tell me things like, well, it's just easier with men. I, I can just meet up with them, date for a couple months, it's over, no big deal. Um, this is what she's telling me in her pocket. If you, it's, it's not always this way, of course, but... And then she says, well, with women, it's much more involved. There's much more of a spiritual connection for me. And so when I'm looking for a long-term relationship, then, then there's a woman that I, that I, I find myself very attracted to women because in that moment, I really want a long-term relationship. So that's just one person. There's a billion other reasons why one would frame or how one would conceptualize their fluctuations within bisexuality. Okay, let's go into your number three. 
So your number three says, what about changing from heterosexual to gay or bi to gay or gay to bi, et cetera? How much of this is due to actual change and how, how much of it is change of awareness? How much of it is a conscious choice? What causes it? I'll also add a note in this category about some trans persons occasionally reporting a shift in sexuality upon hormone replacement therapy. End of email. Yeah. So, you know, why do we do anything? We, we don't know, <laughs> particularly when it comes to sex. We are um, very ad- adaptable and adjustable sexual creatures. We, as, as a species, can, uh, we have a wide variety of behavior, uh, not only in terms of gay, bi, um, and heterosexual, but also just in terms of the way we have sex. There's just so many different ways we have sex, whereas uh, most other animals don't exhibit th- those kinds of variety. And there's a lot of hypotheses as the why we don't know, you know, but the hypothesis that I like is that we developed a higher brain that allows us to adjust that that's one of our biggest strengths as a species is that we can adjust to our environment. If our environment is cold, then we learn how to get uh, animal fur to make us warm and, and to, you know, make fire. If our environment is extremely hot, then we develop whole cultures around, you know, lack of clothing <laughs> to make us, um, you know, we, we, we learn. Um, if our environment has a lot of people, then we learn how to develop laws. If our environment has a lot of settlements, then we learn how to, uh, you know, section off property to make sure that what our work is valued and other people's and other people don't steal our things. We we're just extremely adaptable, and sexuality gets lumped in there, in that when we, uh, you know, are developing as children and into adolescence, our sexuality is is reactive to what's going on around us. If our environment is teaching us that a particular thing is sexually attractive, then it will become hardwired into our sexuality as that is what is sexually attractive. And you, and I've done whole episodes on this, but um, so I won't go into detail, but just take my word for it. <laughs> um, you know, all you have to do is look around the world, particularly toward uh, uh, groups of people who aren't in contact with a lot of mainstream world culture and see that they have very particular ways of expressing sexuality that are quite foreign, maybe to your eyes. And our way of expressing sexuality is very foreign to them. And why is that? You know, did, were they born being attracted to a different thing? No, they, in my hypothesis and other people's is that we are adaptive. Our sexuality is adaptive. Now, having said that, it s- seems as though a lot of people are born gay or born bi or born hetero or born trans, this, this sort of thing, born cis, this sort of thing. So it's, I'm not saying that bisexuality or heterosexuality is somehow emergent from your environment. So both seem to be true, that we're, we're born with certain tendencies and our environment shapes those tendencies. For example, if you're gay, and you're 13 and you're watching a lot of gay porn, then that might shape the way you think of your sexuality because gay porn is maybe the only place that you have any kind of reference for what sexuality is supposed to look like for people like you. Um, so the so the environment uh, can affect things, but it's not going to make you not gay. You know, a, a gay person born gay watching a lot of heterosexual porn isn't going to become heterosexual um, in all likelihood in the vast, vast majority of cases anyway. But as we've been talking this whole time, it's like, well, what is gay exactly? What is hetero? Because there's a lot of overlap. I, I can't remember the stats, but like most heterosexual people have had sexual acts with same, same gender people. And most gay people have had sex with uh, the other gender. And so these are just labels we put to things and labels are important. You know, I'm not saying we get rid of labels. They're good, but we have to consider the fact that they're social constructions and we're not talking about the difference between like a diamond 
and a tree. You know, these are two different things that we can study. A diamond is different than a tree, and we can measure it on the molecular level in the physical realm. There's no, there's no physical marker to being gay. We just have to ask people, like, well, how, how do you identify? And, you know, when you look at your life, what, may, what makes the most sense to you? Do, you? do you think you're bi? Do you think you're gay? Because if we just define bisexual people as engaging in sex with different genders, then a lot of people are bisexual. But when you ask a lot of heterosexual and gay people, are you bisexual? They're going to be like, no, I'm, I'm gay and heterosexual. So uh, this is a very squishy area. And, and so you're asking... You know, if people switch from heterosexual to gay, from bi to gay, from gay to bi, how much is due to, quote unquote, actual change? You're saying, you know, actual change. Well, those things can happen for sure. But again, we'd have to ask that person, you know, the questions you would ask. Let's say someone, be, you know, switched from total he heterosexual to total gay. And they're just like, yeah, I was not questioning I wasn't leaning towards gay at all, and I was totally heterosexual. Then at the age of 32, I'm 100% gay. That doesn't happen usually very often, but, but you know it could happen. And so we would go to that person and we'd say, um, well, let's talk about it. How do you define it? What, was it a biolog Did it feel like a biological change to you? Did anything happen? You know, were there, was there a medical thing like a hor hormone thing that you took that uh, might have switched things over but even if you even if you had you know because this is actually something that um, I have a problem with on the internet sometimes is they'll talk about how people will take ho hormone replacement therapy and then their sexuality their sexual orientation will change well it's impossible to know if the because a lot usually when people are taking hormone replacement therapy there's a whole host of changes going on in that individual's life so because we are in we live in such a i don't know a sort of chemistry oriented society that we tend to if there is a change we're like well it must be the hormone replacement therapy that's why the sexuality changed but there's no way to know that because there's lots of people who go through hormone replacement therapy and they don't have a change in sexuality at all so in terms of who they're attracted to. So it's hard to know, you know, it's really hard to know. And we, we, our science just isn't good enough to make those hard scientific, uh, you know, measurements. So we, a lot of it is just conceptualization. How does, and people are free to conceptualize it as they will. And as long as they stay away from certain hard scientific claims that, you know, their, their truth is their truth. So a heterosexual person becoming gay at 32 could say, well, I, I felt a shift in my biology or I felt like I just grew up. And although I was totally heterosexual earlier and I wasn't closet, I wasn't a closeted gay person, um, but I just turned a new leaf and and I don't know how, you know, so some people might frame that from the outside. It's like, well, you're bisexual then and you're, you're, and you, your bi cycle is just switched from heterosexual to gay at the age of 32. And it might go back at the age of 42, who knows? But the individual is free to decide that how they define that, you know? You also go out, you ask, um, you know, how much of it is it, is it a conscious choice? What causes this? Yeah, I think I kind of answered that. There's, there's just no way to know. <laughs> and we have to value the individual's um, uh, uh, narrative of the situation. Now, there is a lot of science around this. It's not really my area. So I'm not, I'm not saying we don't have studies that inform these questions, you know, the answers to these questions. But I still stand by my answer. Okay, let's take a break and then more speed round. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. He writes, what are your thoughts on introspection and self-diagnosis? Actually, he has four questions, so let me just break it out here. What are your thoughts on introspection and self-diagnosis? Uh, well, my thoughts are that it's it's case by case basis in that for me for example i've self diagnosed ever since i became a graduate student um sometimes effectively and sometimes not 
For example, when I learned about panic disorder in my first or second quarter of graduate school, I effectively and accurately, in my opinion, diagnosed myself with panic disorder. I had a mild case of it in my early 20s. And the diagnosis really helped me to feel normal and to uh, actually have a, a, a route for treating myself, too. I, I self-treated myself for panic disorder and cured myself of it. So self-diagnosis by a clinician is one thing. Self-diagnosis by a non-clinician is going to be a lot rougher. But I've seen people do it, and I can respect that. A lot of listeners right now diagnose themselves with various different personality disorders uh, or with major depression or with you know some attachment issue, this kind of thing. And I think that, you know, uh, it depends on what we do with it, right? So if someone says, I'm diagnosing myself with borderline personality disorder and I know what's best for me and da 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 Well, in terms of treatment. So let me not use a personality disorder because it's probably more disastrous with something else. Like if someone said that instead of let's say that a clinician di would diagnose them with bipolar and instead let's say they diagnose themselves with borderline maybe that's a good example well that person is maybe not going to get the medication and treatment that they need because they have self-diagnosed in an inaccurate way that is going to prevent for them from the treatment that they need so it, it really just depends but i know a lot of you out there will email me and you'll you'll listen to like the avoidant personality disorder deep dive for patrons only. And you'll be like, oh my God, that's me. Uh, I have like almost everything you talked about. Well, I'm pretty confident that if someone listened to that deep dive, because I'd you know, pretty thoroughly describe it, I'm pretty confident that someone would be able to self-diagnose themselves with that to hear that whole thing go like, oh my God, I feel like this guy is describing me. So there are situations where I will absolutely respect it. Let's go on to number two. How does having multiple step parents affect the development of a child and their attachment style? So it's a good question. Just in and of itself, having multiple step parents is not a negative when it comes to attachment. If all, say for example, you have a young boy, you know, zero through 10, and he is raised by mother and three different stepfathers. Well, if all the stepfathers enter his life, enter the boy's life, and stay in the boy's life, then effectively the boy has four parents and four caregivers. And there's, that's beautiful. It's wonderful to have four different people that you can uh, play with and depend on and would probably enhance or at least not negatively impact your attachment style. Whereas if you had one mother and then step parents who came in and out of your life, which is commonly done by the way, which is a, a cultural notion of just like, well, you know, once the divorce happens, if it's not your real child, you need to be out of that family, that kind of thing. Then the child is going to have attachment disruption for sure. For a stepfather to come in at age two and then you know, basically disappear at age six, that is going to negatively, negatively impact the attachment style of the, ch of the child. And we have this, uh, particularly in the configuration I'm talking right now, we have this cultural notion that it's like, well, you know, kids need their mom, but they don't really need their dad, you know, because, and you'll hear people react like this. Like if a, if a mother, if you hear about a mother who doesn't live with her children, like she, uh, you know, say the kids are age five to 15 and she's not the primary custodial parent and the, and the father is, you will just hear gasps of judgment. Like what is going on there? That woman is not. Whereas if a man is the non-custodial parent, or if the man like is a Disneyland dad and is hardly ever around, it's like, well, you know, that's, that's normal. It's men. Children don't understand that cultural concept. Does it doesn't make it any better for them? Children need their their attachment figures, wh whoever they are, whether it's three women or five men or two women and one man. And this includes um, nannies, by the way. This includes people who might work for the family and take care of the kids, or aunts and uncles who are heavily involved in the raising of the children. And 
in the old times, uh, whoever entered your life was not likely to leave it unless they died because there wasn't mobility the way there is today. Now people move all over the place and children are ripped away from their attachment figures regularly. And this is, uh, this is not good. I've worked with so many clients on this, on this very issue. John Bowlby, who invented attachment theory or brought attachment theory to us, or the, one of the big reasons why I think he understood attachment so well is because he had an, he grew up in an affluent family in England and he had a nanny who, and his parents were not really around. And his nanny was effectively his main attachment figure. And then when the nanny left him, which, you know, happens because of employment changes, this sort of thing, this devastated him and, and injured him for the rest of his life. And so, so there's that. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that you could have no step parents and also have negative things happen to your attachment. And, the, you know, you could have parents who stay married throughout your childhood and there can be attachment disruption. So the fact that there are multiple step parents just on, on a, alone does not indicate negative attachment injury. Um, we have to look at it more carefully. Your number three question here is, at what age do mental disorders develop? Well, to answer this question, uh, I'm gonna to speed round, I'm gonna say they develop, uh, depending on the disorder, there is essentially a bell curve of the onset. For example, with uh, schizophrenia, it, the, the, I don't know the, the average, but it tends to develop late teen years, early 20s. But can it develop earlier in life? Absolutely. Can it develop later in life? Yes. But there tends to be a, a, a point at which it develops, which is you know around 22-ish. I can't remember the exact average, but it's around there. Uh, meaning that you could be mostly symptom-free and then boom, at the age of 21, you develop schizophrenia. Uh, bipolar has a similar onset time, maybe a little later. I don't know off the top of my head. But you can have personality disorders that can develop early in life, but you won't necessarily diagnose them because you don't really know, but you know, they certainly happen. You have some disorders that are only developed, that are only um, you know, ad- applied to children, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant, this kind of thing. So it's really throughout the lifespan, but generally speaking, the majority of uh, the onset, it tends to be when people are younger and not when they're post you know, 40 years old. Uh, but certainly are, there are things that tend to develop later in life, Parkinson's, this sort of thing. Anyway, number four, any advice to future Bachelor of Science psychology student? Yes, go to my website, click on the Four Novice Clinicians page and listen to all those episodes. All right, speed round. All right, the next question is anonymous patron. She asks, why do people with borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder tend to date each other? Just chiming in here. Um, I don't know if they do. Um, the The configuration. I've looked into a lot of the research on this, these sorts of things, and it's hard to measure this. One to diagnose people with borderline and narcissism is a lengthy process, and so it's, that's an expensive study. And from my memory, the research on this is that um, there are general things we can say, like the more attachment injured you are, the more likely you are to date someone who is attachment injured, but not always. You have, you have securely attached people who will date and be in long-term relationships with people who have insecure attachment styles. Um, you have people with personality disorders who will date other personality disorders. You have pers- people with personality disorders who date people that don't have personality disorders. So uh, on the internet, I'm guessing maybe this is where you're getting it from an honest patron is that the internet will tend to talk about borderline and narcissism. I I might've even talked about it in the past. It's a, it's a common enough profile that it's worthy of identifying, I suppose. But, but you know, why, why would, you know, generally speaking, someone with borderline date someone with narcissistic personality? Well, of course we're talking about millions and millions of people. So it'd be hard to generalize, but the, the clinical situations that I've seen is that narcissistic people. So it all, it all kind of goes back to the original dilemma that the child goes through early in life when they're going through traumas, 
that they have to decide, is it me or is it them? And to the narcissistic person, they say, it's them, not me. I'm perfect. My parents are stupid. To the borderline person, they say, it's me. I'm a terrible person. My, my parents, my caregivers are perfect. They're awesome. I'm the bad person. That's why this is happening. And so you could imagine that that would fit well together, that the narcissistic person walks around with this false sense of grandiosity in terms of their own self-importance while putting down other people. The borderline person walks around with a, a, a sense of uh, self-worthlessness while worshiping other people. And so this fits well. The borderline person can worship the narcissistic person. The narcissistic person can put down the borderline person and be worshiped and it fits well together. And by fits well, I'm saying that they might be attracted to each other and feel like they're in love in the beginning when in, in actuality, they're just satisfied with the way their working models are fitting together. And so uh, it's, it doesn't end up working very well in the end because there are costs to be paid. For example, the narcissistic person has to uh, deny their own needs usually in this process because they believe they're perfect and they don't need anyone else. And so the narcissistic person will often walk around with a lot of unmet attachment needs. The borderline person walks around being put down and feels bad about themselves. So that's, that's not going to work out usually just because they developed a working model of self that's bad doesn't mean that they're okay with that. It, it you know, it's, it's not ideal. So is that the next question you ask is how different are covert narcissists from borderlines? That's an interesting question. So covert narcissism on the internet, as the way it's described, is not very accurate. Co the, the, the core issue to a covert narcissist is that they have narcissistic personality disorder in the same way that an overt narcissistic personality disorder person does. The issue is, is that they cope with their the underlying cause of the narcissism in a different way than the overt narcissistic people. So listen to my full deep dive for patrons only on narcissistic personality disorder. I go into this in some detail. Maybe I'll go into detail in another episode, but I'm speed rounding. So the, 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 the problem, the central, so for borderline personality disorder, the central trauma is to, is around abandonment. Borderline people, have a schema of abandonment, whether it was through actual abandonment or abuse or something, they have abandonment trauma. To the narcissistic person, they have trauma regarding their own worth. When they were children, they were made to feel extremely worthless. Like, you know, most kids have moments of being treated like they're worthless or that they're, they don't matter or this sort of thing. But to the narcissistic personality disordered individual from a very early age, pervasively throughout their childhood, they were made to feel like they just did not matter and that they are incompetent, that they're, that they're just not important. And the way that they coped with that, the way that they decided to deal with that early in life was to adopt a fantasy that they are the most worthwhile human being on the planet because the way they're being treated it was in a very worthless manner. And so the way that they uphold this, the way that they counteract that worthlessness is to prop up this self that is very, very worthwhile. Underneath that is worthlessness and underneath that is emptiness in the same way that not true emptiness, but a lack of awareness of who they are, a lack of connection with who they are. And so to the, to the borderline person, they are made to feel like they are abandonable. They're also made to feel worthless, but it's in a it's a different flavor of worthlessness. It's it's a their dependency needs. They're going to be they're going to be abandoned by important figures in their life. To the narcissistic person, they can also be abandoned. By the way, oftentimes narcissistic people have similar histories to borderline people, and there's a lot of overlap between the two. You know, I've treated people before where I have collaboratively worked with them on this question is, you know, we're like, is it borderline? Is it narcissism? Sometimes I just say, well, let's just say it's a combination of both. Now that's a little weird giving the working model thing, but, um, and you know, there's no science to this, but anyway, so to the issue of the covert narcissist, they were made to feel worthless. And in some respects, they're more in touch with the fact that they were made to feel worthless. Think of covert narcissism as 
someone as a, someone with narcissistic personality disorder who is somewhat in touch with the fact that they feel worthless to the grandiose narcissistic person they're usually not very insightful about their worthlessness so to the covert narcissistic person they're kind of aware of the fact or they they're very acutely aware of the fact that they feel worthless but the way they cope with it is to prop up this notion that they're awesome and they will obsess in a similar way to the grandiose person. So both the covert narcissistic person and the grandiose narcissistic person, are they compare themselves to other people a lot. They are very envious of other people and, and they want to better people who are considered above them. If they're at work, they want to uh, you know, rise in the ranks uh, of the ladder of the, of the organization. If they don't have as many followers on Instagram. They are desperate to get more followers than the, than the next person above them. But then when they reach that goal, they're, they're, they still feel that worthlessness and they try to cover that up by trying to pursue narcissistic uh, solutions, trying to, you know, the reason why I feel worthless is because that person above me has more followers on Instagram. So I'm going to try to scrape my way above that person. And then that doesn't really solve the the underlying issue, it sort of can mask it temporarily. But so to the, the grandiose narcissistic person, they're just like, I'm doing this because I'm the best. And that's just the way that it is. And everyone better know it because that's just the way it's going to be. To the covert narcissistic person, they kind of know that there's that they're worthless. They kind of know that. But their solution is to obsess on making other people know that they're awesome. Um, both covert and overt narcissistic people are very sensitive to criticism. And um, because of that worthlessness that's underneath, the, the schema of worthlessness is what they're running from. Narcissistic people are in a constant racing, um, you know, racing match against their worthlessness. They're constantly trying to outrun the the, the predator that's trying to chase them down, which is their worthlessness. To the borderline person, they're constantly in a race trying to prove definitively that people will not abandon them. So their demon that's chasing them is you are abandonable. You, no one's going to love you. To the, worth, to the narcissistic person, the demon is chasing them saying, you are worthless. You are nothing. Not only are you abandonable, but you're just not even a human. You don't even exist. You're, you're nothing. And so the way that the narcissistic person chose very early in life to outrun that demon was to constantly define themselves through achievements, accolades from inside of themselves and from outside of themselves. To the borderline person, the behavior ends up being uh, you know, find anyone that is a potential secure attachment and hold on to them as tightly as possible. And if there's any hint that that person is going to move away, even if it's just temporarily, make sure you demand that person does not move away. So, a covert. So, in your question, you say, you know, how different are covert narcissists and borderlines? I would say very different. <laughs> now, could from the outside one see similar behavior? Eh, maybe not to me, not clinically to my eyes. I, I've never. Now, I have said that uh, there can be some people that can exist with both, because borderline people can sometimes be narcissistic, and narcissistic people can sometimes have abandonment. Uh, reactivity. So, you know, what we're talking about is, as I've been saying in other uh, questions, we're, there's no blood test for borderline. There's no blood test for narcissism. We're just talking about a, a construction within our field of conceptualizing human beings. So you, you bring a, a particular, so you bring a borderline male, a man who uh, I would diagnose with borderline personality disorder. You bring that person to 10 clinicians, well, in all likelihood, you're going to get a good number of the clinicians diagnosing that individual with narcissistic personality disorder. Because borderline in men often is mistaken for narcissistic. In fact, when we look at prevalence rates for men and women, 
when it comes to both these disorders. Something like two-thirds of narcissistic people are men and two-thirds of borderline people are women. But when you actually really train people on how to assess and you really try to de-gender the criteria, then some in some studies, they'll find that it's 50-50, that there is no gender prevalence difference when it comes to narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. And I've seen this clinically. I've seen someone that I th- I've seen women who I thought, oh, I would characterize them as narcissistic personality. And my colleagues will say, oh, definitely borderline, because they detect that cluster B presentation. And since it's a woman, they're like, oh, it must be borderline. And in men, it's like, oh, the cluster B must, must be narcissistic because we just have those, those cultural associations. All right. That was the speed round and it's the end of the hour. And I, I felt like I got to, you know, a good amount. I got to a good amount. All right. Uh, everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. 